Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning so we continue our lecture on uh, studio system in Hollywood. Um, we need to remember that we started our lectures from the beginning of cinema. We have been uh, going through a journey of Hollywood cinema through the 20s, 30s and the 40s. Um, I have been uh, talking about directors and films such as Frank Capra and uh, uh, movies such as Gone with the Wind, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and uh, other Capra classics, it happens one, it happened one night and many others. So, the idea is that how the journey started, we have also been talking about the silent films. So, uh, this is uh, um, the, the point, the very point of this entire lecture is to give you an idea of the classic Hollywood period, its narrative and plot structure and the great names associated with that period. Uh, see, uh, cinema does not exist in a vacuum. The idea is that uh, whatever the template was and whatever it, the way it was formed initially, it was followed for a long way to come. Till the early 60s, cinema was essentially uh, more or less under the influence of the studios um, and also it followed a very uh, conventional kind of a structure. Um, that is what I am going to talk to you about today. So, in classic Hollywood or classic films as we call, you know, the, basically this term classic means uh, cinema which came or which was produced during the golden age of Hollywood. So, golden age is now we are moving out of the silent cinema, we are out of the 20s and the 30s and we are more concerned with the 40s and the 50s. So, this is more or less called the golden age of cinema, also the classic Hollywood, the golden age of Hollywood cinema. So, uh, what is a typical narrative structure all about? In classic films of Hollywood, Events are organized around a basic structure with a beginning, middle and end. Now, let me repeat it beginning, middle and end. That means, there is an introduction, there is a kind of a conflict and there is a kind of a resolution that is beginning, middle and end. This pertains to Aristotle's definition of a tragedy or a drama that uh, uh, a tragedy should have a beginning, middle and an end. So, this is important for us to remember. Now, when we were doing Godard, he said on a cinema, a film should have beginning, middle and end, but not necessarily in, an, in that order. So, that was subverting the classic structure, but we are still talking about cinema where structures were up, um, upheld. Now, in classic Hollywood cinema, events had a cause and effect relationship. So, uh, a happened and therefore, B this is a consequence of this, so cause and effect relationship. It was also considered absolutely essential to offer a closure to resolve the disruption and restore the equilibrium. Now, what do you understand by this? That there has to be an ending, an ending has to be satisfactory. It cannot just uh, have an open ended ending. So, there has to be a closure, either they live happily ever after, some resolution is offered such as in Wizard of Oz or it is a tragedy okay. or good versus evil, okay. it is a triumph of good versus evil as in uh, forces of evil movie. Okay. So, what I am talking about is that it was important that the audience get a sense of closure of a movie. Um, and you can start comparing now that we are moving towards 
uh, new Hollywood cinema. No, once we finish classic Hollywood, we will also talk about new Hollywood. And some of you have been sending me mails that uh, uh, while talking about French new wave cinema, I, I touched upon that how it influenced the new wave in Hollywood, the new Hollywood movement. So, we will be talking about new Hollywood as well and how all these conventions were turned upside down. Now, whatever the genre, the plot offers a closure that is classic Hollywood and a message that is central to dominant ideology. See, there is always a message from the beginning of cinema. Uh, Let us consider one of the earliest films that is The Birth of a Nation that is a D. W. Griffiths film and it is driven by a dominant ideology. Okay, uh, whatever, however uh, you may differ, however much you may differ from the ideology, there is a dominant ideology and the dominant ideology belongs to the majority in any country. So, uh, this is one feature of ideology. Ideology, cinema is ideologically driven, we have to consider that. And when there is a closure offered, uh, it is always offered to the satisfaction of the dominant and the, those who are in majority, that kind of ideology always prevails. Now, events develop along a linear structure. So, again we are talking about beginning, middle and end. Opposite of linear structure is circular structure. Quentin Tarantino, for example, in his Pulp Fiction follows a circular structure of storytelling, a narrative. But we are talking about classic cinema where events where events developed in a more linear structure. Now, temporal spatial coherence was the precondition to achieve um, verisimilitude, that is, being true to life. So, uh, it has to have a sense of time and a sense of space. Therefore, so and it has to be uh, there has to be a coherence attached to it. In short, classic Hollywood period aspired to create a fictional world that was understandable and believable. Events are propelled through the agency of the fictional individuals and filmmakers used characters with certain kinds of traits, a good guy, an evil guy, a farm fatal. So, these were the stereotypes and there were certain traits. The idea was that the audience should be able to relate to them and there should be a touch of reality here that yeah, that is the way things really happen in life. Again, in the classic plot as we have been talking about the narrative as I have already told you there is a cause effect link and editing was also influenced by the cause effect link. So, editing which is we have already talked about a juxtaposition of individual shots. During the very early years of cinema as you would remember, films consisted of single shots and required no editing. Classic narrative follows the continuity editing style where ending predominantly remains uh, sorry where editing remains invisible, but then Godard came along and changed all that if you remember jump cuts use of jump cut. Okay, so, uh, we no longer thought of uh, editing as invisible. Now, if you look at uh, uh, editing techniques such as jump cut, montage and all, they are used to very good effect in order to um, draw attention to themselves. So, we always uh, often say uh, the director is a very good technician. Now, what do you understand by technician? That means, he has a good command over the cinematography, over uh, uh, the construction of screenplay and also the editing device techniques. So, that is what we mean that this is a very competent filmmaker. Um, now, classic narrative insists on individual shots ordered according to the temporal sequence of events, thus helping in causal logic that is one thing linked effectively to another. In the classic Hollywood period or in, gold, in the golden years of Hollywood, screenplay followed the classic three act structure and product producers dictated terms that it has to a uh, uh, screenplay should necessarily have a three act structure. The cinematography of classic Hollywood films 
consists of close ups, dissolves and fades in. Classic Hollywood is also known to use lighting in way to make their stars look more um, attractive than they really were. So, lighting was important, it was very important to use soft focus lenses in order to make the hero look uh, you know younger or heroine look much more uh, much prettier than she really was. So, those were the techniques. So, that is all uh, they needed by way of cinematography which is things have started changing after the beginning of the new Hollywood period. Another feature was the use of Irish shots. Nowadays, it is, it is a, a occasionally used by Martin Scorsese and this is to denote a cut. So, deep focus cinematography also came in prominence from 1940s onwards. And um, now, let me introduce you to some of the greatest Hollywood uh, films of this period. We are still in the studio era and you are I am sure that you remember what were the great the great studios of that period. So, we have been talking about 20th century Fox, MGM, uh, Columbia Pictures, Warner Brothers, RKO. So, this is what I am talking I am taking you on a journey about on uh, making you familiar with one some of the greatest Hollywood films made during the studio era. So, um, one uh, one of the earliest films, again this is a silent film, it is called Greed, it is a 1924 film uh, produced by MGM and directed by Eric von Stroheim. Now, this is a name that you should know, he is considered one of the earliest masters of cinema and he was a very unusual kind of a filmmaker, his films were not at all um, populist or made to you know, um, perhaps uh, uh, pander to the masses. He belonged to the category of very experimental filmmakers, very experimental according to uh, the standards of those times. Now, Greed is based on a novel by uh, a great American writer of naturalism, Frank Norris. Norris's novels focused on the harsh life of the working class people. Now, Greed is based on Norris's story, um, McTeague, a story of San Francisco, M C T E A G U E, McTeague, a story of San Francisco. The film is set in a small mining town where McTeague, a local miner, he becomes an apprentice to a dentist. Now, he is not trained, he is just an apprentice, he works with the dentist for a short while and then soon starts his own practice. He uh, meets a young woman Trina and she first enters his life as his patient, he falls in love with her and they become engaged to be married. In the meanwhile, Trina wins a huge sum in lottery and uh, calls her former lover Marcus back to the town. Now, though she marries McTeague, she is physically repulsed by her husband. Uh, they have several fights and in uh, one of the fights, McTeague um, ends up killing her, murdering her. Now, uh, before that he also loses his job because it is found out that he is after all not a properly trained dentist. So, he loses his job, he loses his wife and now he takes her lottery money and runs away from the town. However, he is pursued by Marcus who wants the reward money for capturing the murder. So, all this follows, um, there is a bloody climax where in the final showdown both men end up killing each other, but it is a long drawn fight. They are wounded, bruised, badly bruised, bleeding and also dehydrated, there is no water, there is nothing else around them and this dire slow death. Now, Greed is regarded as a great film and it has established Eric von Stroheim, rep, uh, his reputation as one of the earlier greats of cinema. It is also worth noting that it is a great naturalistic film where um, the lives of the working class people 
and it is absolutely shown of all kinds of idealism which is na uh, not naturally you know which was normally associated with uh, the working class people. So, here they are shown as uh, people who are driven by greed, by lust, by ambition. So, that is those were the features of naturalism, naturalistic novels and this comes across very effectively in uh, greed. Now, uh, another film which is very uh, completely opposite of greed is The General, which is a 1927 film. Uh, it is a Buster Keaton film. Now, Buster Keaton is another great that you should be familiar with. He was born Joseph Francis in a family that is specialized in vaudeville. Vaudeville is a stage act. Now, he started uh, his uh, he, he started his career with um, another well known comedian Fatty Arbuckle in 1917. Keaton was a genius as well as a masterful filmmaker. He was one of the most innovative of directors and paid a lot of attention to details. His films and particularly Keaton himself he is interesting because of the uh, surreal quality of his films. Also, the way he would be very stoic on screen. Now, um, compared to Chaplin, he is often compared to Chaplin because both are comedians in the silent era. He was also uh, uh, known for his uh, expertise in performing his own stunts, which is evident from his preference for long fluid takes. Another major uh, factor for his lasting popularity is that he um, eschewed slapstick, favoring a more subtle comic style. So, that is where he differs from Chaplin. His persona was like uh, he is uh, absolutely indefatigable in face of troubles. His signature style was the stoically brave face that he would uh, maintain in spite of all the odds. Now, the general is considered Keaton's greatest comedy and is set during the civil war. The action takes place during the civil war. The general is actually the name of the locomotive and Keaton is an engineer, Johnny Gray, who loves his engine and also a girl, Annabel Lee. The uh, film clearly supports the south, ideologically it's, it is, it goes with the south. Um, as we know, as we find that the Yankees are hell bent on stealing the general, that locomotive. Much of the action centers on Keaton's search for the general and winning over the girl and the film is uh, full of uh, hilarious gags. Keaton's uh, memories live on. Um, his uh, many admirers are Liu Binel. We have already talked about Liu Binel. Chuck Jones, Woody Allen, Jackie Chan and Steven Spielberg who frequently pay homage to his brand of comedy. Because of his ability to keep his composure and a very stoic face in the middle of chaos, he was often called the great stone face. Here is a clipping from the general, please watch it. Next great film is uh, Citizen Kane, 1941, directed by Orson Welles and produced by RKO Mercury. The film opens with one of the most memorable words in the history of cinema, Rosebud, which is uttered by our dying hero just as the film begins. Now, a journalist is assigned the task of investigating the mystery behind the enigmatic word and thus it starts a journey on exploring the world of ambition and power. So, it is uh, one of the earliest experiments in telling us uh, a multifaceted story. So, it is not just one story that we get to know. Charles Foster Kane is seen through the eyes of several other people who had the fortune or the misfortune to know him and to love him and is their versions that is important here. So, 
it is not just one uh, uh, you know single personality, but he is informed. Foster Keynes in uh, characters is informed by the narratives of several onlookers, several other characters and that is what makes the film such a great movie as far as narrative is concerned, but then it is also extremely well regarded for its technical superiority. Wells worked with uh, the great cinematographer Greg Tolland and he tried to increase the image's depth of field by challenging the centrality of perspective and therefore, he perfected not introduced, but rather perfected the deep focus style of cinematography. Citizen Kane has often found a place um, in all time great films. Um, for a very long time, it was rated number 1 or number 2 on the list of uh, top 100 or you know all these canonical lists that film that uh, that uh, film critics and experts uh, frequently makes come up with. So, um, even today it has its very unique place, very honored place among the canonical the best of Hollywood films. Initially released it was advertised as the classic story of power and the press and also called the greatest film of all time. Now, the film has been declared as the best film of all time several times. Sight and Sound magazine, a very respected film magazine has rated it four times as the most admired film of all time. Next great movie under discussion should be The Grapes of Wrath. Now, this is a John Ford film produced by 20th Century Fox in 1940. It is based on John Steinbeck's novel of the same name and is set during the American Depression which began in 1929. It is a it is an extremely important period in socio-political history of America. Those of you who are interested in knowing more about American literature should perhaps read the original novel and watch the film as well. John Ford uh, a word about him, he was one of the most prolific directors of Hollywood and is known in our collective consciousness as the man who made westerns. Of course, some of the greatest westerns are associated with John Ford. Now, this image has endured though he made films from other genres as well. The Grapes of Wrath is regarded as one of the greatest films of American cinema and is extremely accurate in its portrayal of social conditions. Casablanca is yet another great film of this period, Casab Casablanca directed by uh, Michael Curtis in 1942 stars Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman. The plot involves ex expatriate American Rick Blaine who is a cynical nightclub owner in Casablanca. He discovered that his former girlfriend Ilsa as played by Ingrid Bergman uh, who abandoned him several years ago in Paris has just arrived in Casablanca. She is here along with her husband Victor uh, as played by Paul Hanrind uh, who is a, a resistance leader uh, who opposes the Nazi German Nazi forces and now the Germans are pursuing Victor. It is in this scenario that Ilsa uh, begs Rick's help to save her husband by providing him with the necessary documents and papers. See, Rick is well established, he is he has networked and he has come up the hard way. He is very well known among the officers in Casablanca and Elsa needs Rick's help to save her husband. And this is this makes the plot now is all set for a great love story, a story of uh, you know love, desire and sacrifice. Casablanca is also remembered for some of the most iconic lines in cinema. Other film that I would like to talk about is uh, completely opposite in genre from Casablanca. This is a western called My Darling Clementine, which was made in 1946. <coughs> According to many film viewers and critics, this is the best film about the legendary gunfight at the OK. Coral between Wyatt Earp 
as played by Henry Fonda and the Clinton brothers. Here we uh, the plot is all about Earp and his brothers have driven their cattle to the outskirts of Tombstone, Arizona. Earp rejects the cut price that old man Clanton has to offer for the cattle. A bloody climax follows and uh, it is regarded for its wonderful sequences and great performances. This is a John Ford film. Uh, film Noah 2 was an important moment as we have already discussed it, it discussed it was not necessarily a genre, but a style of filmmaking. So, uh, we have one of the most prominent films of this uh, style or this category that is the Big Sleep 1946 directed by the great Howard Hawks where Humphrey Bogart plays a private detective Philip Marlowe. He is summoned by someone called General Sternwood to investigate a blackmailer, uh, a book dealer who has uh, somehow obtained or taken compromising photographs of the general's daughter. Now, this is an unwieldy plot. The screenplay is credited to the great author William Faulkner with Raymond Chandler being the original author. Raymond Chandler is the author of or the creator of the great detective Philip, no Philip Marlowe. So, this movie belongs to uh, or the novel belongs to the classic pulp fiction category. Okay, and there were a series of great films based on the works of uh, Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett starring many of which starred um, Humphrey Bogart. White Heat 1949 is a gangster film which I have been telling you is another very uh, important American import gangster and the western. So, this is a gangster film directed by Raoul Welsh and it stars the great James Cagney. Cagney's character was based on the real life gangster Arthur Doc Bick, uh, Barker. The final image is shot atop an actual oil refinery in California. Watch this scene from White Heat, the top of the world scene. Many films of this period uh, are associated again with Orson Welles. The Third Man 1949 directed by Carol Reed and uh, uh, it is now regarded as one of the most astonishing products of the Hollywood of the classic Hollywood period. Orson Welles here plays Harry Lyme and his first appearance is with him standing in a doorway and uh, suddenly getting limbed you know bathed in a shaft of light one of the most uh, quoted or most referred to alluded to um, entries, entry scenes in cinema. It is made from a Graham Greene screenplay written for this film uh, where many cinematic talents came together. It is a very dark atmospheric film, film noir film. It is set in the war torn Vienna and much of the thrill has to do with Orson Welles's portrayed or uh, portrayal of the villain who sells um, contaminated or watered down penicillin. The film was noted for its visual depiction of decayed building shots from unusual camera angles. Watch this scene, memorable scene from the third man Orson Welles's appearance. Another great film of this period, this is a Billy Wilder film, Sunset Boulevard, a 1950 film, which is Billy Wilder's portrait of a forgotten star from the silent cinema. It is one of the most um, respected film and one of the most famous films that talks about uh, uh, cinema. Okay, so, it is a film about films. It is a classic noir where a dead body in a swimming pool tells us the story in a voice over. This device as you would remember was also uh, 
followed by so this device influenced Sam Mendes's American Beauty. If you remember Lester Burnham and his opening scenes where he talks about his own death. So, Sunset Boulevard is all about a, an actress, a once famous actress Norma Desmond as played by Gloria Swanson. She is wealthy, she lives in a big Hollywood mansion, yet she is lonely. She has no one else to give her company except her former director and husband, but who is now her chauffeur, played by again the great Eric von Stroheim and I have already referred him to uh, referred to him as the director of greed and a director of great films from that period. He also directed Gloria Sonson in a movie called Queen Kelly and portions of that film are shown in Sunset Boulevard. So, it is like a uh, you know meta cinema, a homage to cinema, but also a very scathing attack on cinema. Billy Wilder was castigated by several people uh, for biting the hand that feeds him, because he, he uh, portrayed Hollywood as uh, a machinery that produces stars and consumes them and then spits them out. So, now Norma still lives in a world of illusions, believing that she has legions of fans awaiting her come back on screen. A famous line goes as, I am big is the pictures that got small. A word about Billy Wilder, Billy Wilder was born in Austria. He left Germany because of his Jewish background and moved to Hollywood in 1934. His most fil uh, famous films are renowned for their misanthropic cynicism and skepticism and are today considered extremely melodramatic. Wilder's lists of films are Double Indemnity, Ace in the Hole, Sabrina, The Seven Year Itch, Some Like It Hot, these two are with Marilyn Monroe, The Apartment and The Private Lives of Sherlock Holmes. A film, a great film that must find its place in uh, this lecture is Singing in the Rain. It is a 1952 film directed by Stanley Donnan. The film is set in Hollywood in the 20s when cinema was making its transition to talkies. Now, uh, actress Jean Hagen, she is Jean, Jean Kelly's silent screen co-star whose voice is not fit for the changing scenario and much of the plot is centered on this transition. Here is a memorable song from Singing in the Rain. Please watch it and enjoy it. Other great films of this period are Some Like It Hot, The Best Years of Our Lives, On the Waterfront that is an earlier Kazan film, The Bridge on the River Kauai and of course, Hitchcock Psycho and Vertigo. By the mid 60s, major studios started collapsing and this was also aided by the popularity of the television. Of course, hefty star salaries and mismanage mismanagement by the st uh, studio executives also played an important pa part in the decline of the great studios. And this led to uh, the great experiment in American cinema and some of the greatest films of American cinema came out during the period that followed the collapse of the studios. We will be talking about the new Hollywood period in our next class. Thank you very much.